Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. Um, this is going to be an interesting video. <laughs> Today we are going to be talking about Echo by Thomas Oyld Hoyvelt. Um, this was one of my most anticipated books for 2021, and then it didn't come out in 2021, and then became one of my most anticipated books in 2022, and has finally come out. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to talk about two things really, really quickly. First up, I know I mentioned in a recent video, um, I wanted to see if anybody would be interested in a giveaway for a brand new signed copy of Waif by Samantha Kolesnik. Um, a lot of people did seem interested in it, so I will most likely have the giveaway going up probably on Monday, maybe Thursday. It'll be in conjunction with one of my next videos for sure, so I will give an announcement about it. All of the information on the giveaway will be on my Instagram, at Violet Prin. Um, if you do not follow me on Instagram, uh, please check out my Instagram and you will see where I do all of my giveaways, a lot of different reviews, and I do a lot of documenting of my haunted travel there as well. Way more so than I do here on BookTube. Second, I went and saw that new movie, The Cursed, like two days ago. It's like a, a werewolf movie um, by this like indie director I'd never heard of before called Sean Ellis, and it looked um, very like gothic and dark and atmospheric. Um, it's set in 1882 and it is just a brilliant, beautiful werewolf movie. It might be, I think it actually is the best werewolf movie I've ever seen. The film pays homage to American Werewolf in London, to the Beast of Javadon, um, Brotherhood of the Wolf, if you're unfamiliar with the, the story of the Beast of Javadon. Um, it pays tribute to the original Wolfman film, um, with Lon Chaney. Like, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, took my breath away. It is a very, very slow burn with a lot of action sequences thrown throughout. Um, doesn't have a great CGI wolf in it, but it does have amazing practical effects. And the cinematography was some of the best cinematography I have ever seen in my life. There's one scene, and it is there's no cuts in the whole thing, the camera doesn't move, it's a wide angle shot, and it is so long and so well done and just disturbing and mind blowing, and I've never seen anything like it in a film before, and it just blew my mind away. Um, if you have not seen that movie, I highly, highly, highly recommend you check it out. It gave me Crimson Peak vibes, it gave me um, The Witch vibes, um, and I love Del Toro, I love um, Robert Eggers. And I'm really interested to see what else Sean Ellis has in store. It was originally released in Sundance, I think a year or two ago, under the name Made for Silver, and then got pushed back because of the pandemic. It's finally out. Nobody seems to be talking about it, but it is absolutely incredible, especially if you are into gothic period piece horror. Oh my god, it's incredible. It, it, I, I cannot stop gushing about it. I know there's a lot of mixed reviews on it, but I personally adored it. Five out of five, <laughs> movie-wise. I know I normally don't talk about movies here, but I absolutely adored it. Anyway, now that we've talked about something positive, let's talk about something eh, not so positive. So, Echo by Thomas Oyld Hoyvelt. Before I really dive into Echo, I want to preface this with one of the reasons this was my most anticipated read of 2022 is because I loved Hex. Hex was Thomas Oyld Hoyvelt's. Um, breakthrough novel. He had written, I believe, five novels previously, only in Dutch, and then he wrote Hex, and it got translated into a ton of different languages. I think it was in like 29 different countries. It blew up. I think they're making it into a TV show. Like, Hex is amazing. Um, it was a four-star read for me because the ending's kind of weird, and it's very creepy and disturbing and just very original. I've never read a witch story like it before. Um, Echo actually references Hex, which is really cool. Um, and I adored it, so I was really excited to read this. One of the things I loved about Hex is how um, Thomas Old Hoyvelt really incorporates technology and modern um, advancements and technological advancements into his story. Um, YouTube's very, very prominent in Hex, and it just worked so well. And I will say that Echo does a lot of stuff with, like, Instagram, um, and FaceTime, like there's a lot of very prominent technology in Echo, which I did really, really like because I think it makes it more realistic, but Echo just was not, it was not Hex for me, and I think I'm very upset that Echo was not Hex. 
Um, I'm gonna read the back of the book for y'all. I actually don't really think the back tells you much of anything about what this book is about because I read this book and I was like, I don't remember reading about that. Okay. Travel journalist and mountaineer Nick Grievers wakes from a coma to find that his climbing buddy Augustine is missing and presumed dead. Nick's own injuries are as extensive as they are horrifying. With his face wrapped in bandages and unable to speak, Nick claims amnesia, but he remembers everything. He remembers how he and Augustine were mysteriously drawn to the Mountain, a remote and scarcely documented peak in the Swiss Alps. He remembers how the slopes of the Mountain were eerily quiet, and how when they entered its valley, they got the ominous sense that they were not alone. He remembers something was waiting for them. But it isn't just the trauma of the accident that haunts Nick. Something has awakened inside of him, something that endangers the lives of everyone around him. It's one thing to lose your life, it's another to lose your soul. Um, so I really wanted this book to be kind of like mountain horror. I really wanted the story to be about two men out on a mountain. Um, and like, just like, I guess maybe flashbacks, flash forwards of like him remembering and like looking back on what happened. Be, like I could see it being like very piecemeal of a story that you like put together. And the book is that. It's just really not focused at all on the mountain adventure, which I think was a big issue for me. Um, in fact, it is more focused on Nick, our main character, who was injured in this mountain climbing accident, and his boyfriend, Sam. Who So Nick is a Dutch man, they both live in Holland together, um, they both live in Amsterdam together, and Sam is this American trust fund baby from New York. They've lived together for like three years. Um, and this is kind of where I have the problem. The first 50 pages of this book are terrifying, and it feels very much like a haunted mountain ghost story. The last 50 pages, minus like the last 20, also very scary, very well done, feel like this kind of ominous ghost story. Everything else in between is kind of this jumbled clusterfuck of different concepts that never quite make sense, never quite get fully answered, and kind of just... You could have taken 200 pages out of this book, and I still would have gotten the exact same story. The story focuses so much on the relationship between Sam and Nick um, and the aftermath of this mountain climbing accident that you actually lose the effects of the horrors that happened at the mountain climbing accident. I also think that Old Helvoet did a really interesting thing. The, the monster in this book, uh, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but the monster creature feature, whatever it is, the ghost you want to... I don't even know what I would call it because I don't actually understand what it is and I just read a 400 page book on it. Um, and that's kind of the problem. I don't understand what it was. They talk about a lot of folklore, they have a lot of like scared Swiss citizens, very hesitant about this thing up in the Alps. It gets kind of midsummery towards like the last third, um, like a little culty but like not, I don't know. There was just a lot of ideas in the story thrown together. Um, and then never refined or edited out. And one of the things that uh, really, really stuck out to me is when um, Hex was translated into English, um, Thomas Oyd Helvoet, I'm not gonna be able to say his name right ever, I'm sorry, um, I'm gonna call him Thomas. Thomas um, translated the entire thing himself to make it more understandable to an American audience. And he took, um, the setting out of New out of the Netherlands and he put it in like upstate New York. Not upstate New York, Westchester, New York, but above right up north of Manhattan. And I thought that was weird. Like he didn't really need to do that. But now reading this, I kind of understand why he did it. There are so many moments in this novel where you need to really understand um, mountain climbing terminology to understand what they're talking about. You really probably want to know French and German and Swiss and Dutch to know what they're talking about because a lot of times they don't actually translate some of the stuff that's being said. Um, and it just got to a point where there were so, oh, and like medical terminology. Like I have no doubt that Thomas is a very, very intelligent man and I know he actually is a mountain climber in like real life. Um, but the amount of times that I would need to Google something to understand what was happening um, just became overwhelming. I did want to DNF this book about halfway through. I trudged through it. It took me 10 days to read this, which is a lot for me. This is going to ruin um, my, 
my wrap up at the end of the month. I wanted to get through at least six books and there's just no way I'm going to hit six. I don't even think I'm going to hit five because um, this book was so hard to get through and it was so wordy. And f again, it focused so much on Sam and Nick's relationship and then Sam's own personal trauma as a child and Nick's kind of weird maybe sociopathic childhood tendencies? I don't know. There was some weird stuff going on with their background, but way too much background information, not enough story for me to ever be interested. And a lot of the information was so vague and left for us to interpret that I just kind of got lost in it. And sorry, go, I got totally off track there. But one of my things uh, with this is when it came to the translation, the, the translator of this book I feel like butchered everything that Sam Avery, the, the other main character of the story, not the mountain climber, everything that Sam Avery said. Um, he is from New York. He is from upper society New York. And he has phonetically in the book written out the most cliche, stereotypical New York accent ever. And it's not just when he's speaking. It's like, in his journals, when he's writing, he's writing with a New York accent. Like, they never say could have. Sam Avery's character never says could have, and it's never spelled could have. It is spelled coulda, C-U-D-D-A. Sometimes there's an H thrown in. Like, it was infuriating to read. And what pissed me off even more about that is, yeah, he is a native New Yorker, and I'm sure that this translation, or maybe Thomas was trying to make like a like, this is the American accent coming through because the rest are all, like, very European characters. But he didn't give any European characters accents. And this was so absurdist um, and just unrealistic. And I understand when you put an accent in somebody speaking in quotations. But when it's, like, their diary and they're spelling things incorrectly to have a New York accent, it was just so jarring. It felt juvenile. And I'm like, an editor didn't take that out. The translator translated a New York accent into it. Like, it just felt weird. And I think there's a lot of metaphors that went into this novel. And there's a lot of really disturbing imagery. Um, the people who've been taken over by the mountains and who are assimilated with the death birds. Um, that, all of that imagery is utterly terrifying. The opening scene with Julia in the cabin. That whole concept, horrifying. Um, Sam is a kid going down the mountain with his grandparents. That whole scene, terrifying. But the rest was just so boring that I just didn't care. And everything was so wordy that I just didn't care. And I just wanted to climb the mountain that was this book and be done with it. Because I didn't understand the motives of this creature, monster, entity, force. I don't understand what it is. I don't understand anything about the folklore. And it just kind of was like accepted that I should. And then it hit me like halfway through the book. Oh, this is a metaphor. Um, and the problem is I couldn't figure out if this is a metaphor for the loss of a loved one and grief or getting out of a toxic relationship. And I think you can argue both sides pretty equally um, that everything that we're reading is actually through Sam's eyes and everything that we're looking at is him coping with either grief and loss we're getting out of a toxic relationship, but I'm not really sure what in the end um, Thomas wanted the message to be. And it made it even more confusing because when you read the afterword, he talks about how he wrote this book with a climbing buddy who he died in real life um, that he's very upset about. And then he dedicates it to like one of like the loves of his life. So it's like, it's very difficult to read. Um, yeah. And as a love story, like, it's interesting. I don't necessarily think Sam or Nick are likable characters. Um, you really want to be invested in their relationship and their relationship before the story takes place, like all the flashbacks, seems really cool and happy and healthy and fun and lighthearted. Um, and then just kind of descends into this whirlwind of chaos and evil which again is what leads me to the how do you escape a toxic relationship. And I think if you read the book from Sam's perspective of the mountain accident with Nick leading to when the relationship turns from the honeymoon phase to that toxic 
dragging you down phase, it makes the book make a little bit more sense. Um, and I just feel like Thomas got really lost in creating some kind of metaphor, some kind of concept, and he'd never just stuck the landing, but the, the stuff that you're supposed to infer was so difficult to infer because it's just so vague in so many different places. Like, I'm not sure what happened at the end of the book. I don't. Um, like, the last 10 pages of the book, I cannot tell you what happened. <laughs> It's just, it got very weird and very confusing. And I wanted to love it. And I do feel like there was a lot of this book that was lost in translation. Um, this is a three star read for me. I debated giving it a two star read, um, but I couldn't because I did see that there's so much potential for a really good, really creepy story. But this just re like really needed an editor. It really needed to be restructured. The timelines were so all over the place. And I think if we had focused more on like Nick's experiences on the mountain and then the aftermath as a secondary thing, we would have gotten a much stronger, more cohesive story. Um, and there's a lot of things that were just like blown up. Like I would love to know the folklore behind where this like weird mountain evil lore comes from. And it was just lost on me. I thought the birds were a really interesting concept, but we didn't really get into it. There's a random scene where Nick breaks into a house and he sees this horrifying image of this old man, and I'm just gonna leave it at that so I don't ruin it, and then it's just never brought up again. It's never brought up again, and I was like waiting for that to come back, and there's just so many moments where like, you're like waiting for something to come back, and it just doesn't, or it does in like a very quick anticlimactic way, and there was just so much potential for this book to be really cool and really scary, and you see a lot of highlights of like, Thomas is writing from Hex in here, but it just wasn't ever actualized. This felt like a first draft of a very cool concept and it just got published as it is. And I know that Thomas in the afterward did say that he, this was the hardest story he's ever had to write. Um, it was also a very personal story for him, so I can see why there's probably a lot that he could infer himself because he experienced what he's trying to get across, but for the reader it was very, very jumbled. Um, and I think one of the things that makes it even more difficult is this like whole lost in translation thing. His afterward, I'm sure he wrote in English because it is dedicated to the American and um, UK audiences. Um, and it just read as easily as Hex did. Like it was fun, it was snappy, like it got to the point. Whereas the rest of this writing was just so unnecessarily descriptive without ever actually saying anything. Anyways, so I really, really wanted to read this. Um, I did not DNF it. I really debated DNFing it. I kind of regret not DNFing it, uh, just because I just never got anything out of it. Um, but I am very happy to have read something where the concept was so original. Um, I just really wish it had been more refined. He does say that he has another book coming out very soon called Oracle. I would definitely give him another chance, but this really just, this was so hard to get through. And I wanted to love it. I really, really wanted to love it. And it just, it didn't work for me. Anyways, that is all that I have for you guys today. As always, I post every Monday and Thursday, sometimes on Saturdays. And if you enjoyed this video, please give a like and subscribe down below. And I will catch you all in the next one. Mwah.